Hello and welcome to a highly caffeinated episode of Tidy X. All right, so this is episode 18. Uh, Tidy X is a screencast where we go through and try to explain how our code works and uh, try to make it more accessible for people. Uh, my name is Ellis Hughes. I am a statistical programmer at Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center. And I'm Patrick Ward. I do data analysis in sport. And uh, you can always hit both of us up either on our YouTube channel or at tidy.explained at gmail.com. Ellis, I can see you today. Yes, yeah. So uh, we're trying out something new uh, this episode. We're, we're trying to do some webcam additions to our, our screencast here. So we're using, using Zoom to do this like everyone else in this COVID era. Uh, we're finally getting with the times after 18 episodes. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So this week's Tidy Tuesday data set is on coffee. So we were both, I mean, I know I was excited about it. I, I love coffee. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm an aficionado. I just drink it for the caffeine. Um, but I think a lot of people had a, a lot of fun with it this week. Um, people, you know, there are tons of plots. I think Cedric Scherer, I think you said, I said your name correctly, had some be a beautiful plot uh, showing like the this, the distribution of total cut points. So uh, every week he has a beautiful. Yeah. Plot. So check <laughs> that out. Um, but we also. You know, there were a bunch of great submissions. Uh, the submission that we picked this week was from Dr. Nissa Silberger. I'm very sorry if I mispronounced that na your name, um, but we loved your plot this week. Uh, it was, I mean, we had a lot of fun looking at it. Um, we think it shows uh, really cool variability between the different countries where the beans can come from. Uh, it shows faceting, which is always a really um, useful technique that people can always learn more about. Um, and we love to use coffee beans as, as the point there. Uh, I mean, we, it, that just kind of makes it really fun to do. Um, and it's really interpretable. You can you know, look across these and go, all right, Panama has you know, just a little bit above aftertaste compared to everyone else, and a little, little bit less aroma from reading this properly, and the body is a little bit lower. Um, you know, but for if what I care about is a really sweet coffee, you know, I guess there's a lot that are that are pretty high there. But like Zambia, you know, it's pretty pretty sweet there, but doesn't have much flavor. United States has more flavor, but isn't as sweet. Uh, Hawaii is on um, average sweet. So it was just like a great way to go through and look through your data um, and, and do that. So she also has a group I believe called Tidy Doers. Um, and they use the hashtag tidy doers and so that's kind of fun because we were able to look at that and look at all, all the other people that are posting with that hashtag and um, see what they've been doing as well. So keep up the good work. Um, so she posts her data on GitHub which is available right here and so I went and copied this script into my R session which I just brought up up here and we're gonna go through that. Alright, so and it's an R script so it's not R markdown. Um, so we, I mean, I definitely prefer using R Markdown, but you can get just as good with, with R. Um, I like what she does here at the very top here. Let me zoom in. All right. So at the very top here, she has the, the name of the script, like what she's trying to do here, so Tidy Tuesday Coffee, the date in which she wrote it, uh, or, or what it's for. I'm assuming it's the date she wrote it, which was uh, July 7th, and then who wrote it. So this is really good meta information to have in basically all your scripts, so that when somebody else comes to it, or even you come to it in a few months, you're able to remember what was going on. So that's that's highly valuable, in my opinion. Uh, next, she loads in her libraries. So Tidyverse, you know, very that's what everyone does these days if they're doing data manipulation. Uh, GG Image, so this is a library for manipulating images inside your GG plots, and then adding images to that. Um, the library Harbor Themes, which is from Bob Rudis, um, his um, Twitter handle is uh, Harbor Master. Um, I think we've talked about him a few times in the past. And this library, Our Color Brewer. So that's a library for helping you pick uh, color palettes. Uh, it's got a load, loads of libraries or uh, uh, palettes in there, and it's just incredibly helpful um, to look at that. All right. So after she let's let's bring up those libraries there. Running that. All right, so next uh, she has this uh, the slug here where she's loading in the coffee ratings. Um, you can, Tidy Tuesday R is actually on version 1.0.1 now on CRAN. Um, so you can also use that to load it in just by typing in uh, 2020 week, uh, shoot, I don't know what the week this was. Um, 
whatever. I'll, I'll put that in later. But uh, you could also just put in the date, which was July 7th. So 2020-0707, and it'll download all that for you. All right, so next she does, she's trying to make a lollipop park. She, she, she states that at the very beginning there. So that she, she has a very clear understanding of what she's wanting to go for. Uh, Patrick, do you maybe want to take us through this next chunk here? Yeah, I think you got to load the data first. Oh, <laughs> there we go. What are you talking about? No, no, no it just it just exists. <laughs> um, so she's going to get the mean line. Uh, uh, so she's going to get the mean score for the middle line. So if you remember that uh, that plot that she had, there was a vertical line running that represented the. Uh, there it is. Nice little vertical line that gives us a visual of where the mean is. So we have a reference point when looking at the data. So she creates this. She takes the coffee ratings data that we just loaded. She uses summarize at. Uh, so I'll walk through this, and then maybe we can talk about a way that we could do this differently. Um, summarize at is going to be a function that's going to summarize. So she's going to create a new data frame. This is going to be a summary data frame. She's passing it the variables of interest. So dot bars. She wants sweetness, aroma, flavor, body, and aftertaste. She passes it the function that she wants, which is an average. And then she's going to use a pivot longer. So right now, the data is in what's called a wide format, where you have a each row is a, uh, is a country of origin, and then the, the, respective, um, uh, the respective scorings. Uh, she's going to spin this out and make it go long, so each row is a country and that variable. And it's just going to be a country, variable, scoring. Country, variable, scoring for each of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 variables that she's yeah. established. So, um, yeah. I, I think we, we jumped ahead there uh, because this one, she doesn't do a group by. Right? Oh, she so does not do a group by. Sorry. Not yet. Yeah, so right. this is this is just doing it. So in, if, if you're summarizing without using grouping, it's going to do it across the entire data set. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so, so this she, is... She, this is just to establish the... Uh, I did jump ahead there. Yeah, there is no group by there. Yeah. So this <laughs> is just to establish the line straight across... Uh, for all groups, so this should be, yeah, there we go. Nice little tibble with the categories and the endpoints. Another way you could have done this in uh, newer versions of Tidyverse would be to do summarize and then across. So basically summarize and then across is which columns across that you want to, uh, or that you want to summarize across. And then you pass it your function of functions of interest and you can do the exact same thing what? and produce the same results. Uh, ba boom. Yeah. So that uh, that's a nice one because it removes the. Um, I think like like used to be like you'd have to do summarize at summarize if some, you know all of those kinds of things. Now you can kind of just tell it what you want. Explicitly. Yeah. 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 It's, I think this this is a uh, new as of deplier 1.0.0. Um, I think it's a pretty cool thing. I, I never really grokked the uh, summarize underscore if at like I could do it. I'd have I'd always have to look it up. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, uh, so either I, way, it's yeah. going to get you the same result. Um, and the next one that she does now is the uh, the average by country. So that's yeah. the, the jump ahead. Now she does her group by uh, literally the the same type of code in the summarize and the pivot. Now she's spinning that out into a uh, a longer format, and then she's joining in the averages. So she's going to get a column that has the average for each of the um, uh, categories, is what she called. Mm -hmm. And then the mutate is uh, uh, position negative if else. So if the endpoint, if the value that she created, the average value that she created, is greater than zero, it gets a um, POS for positive. Uh, tag and if it's below zero, it's going to get NEG for a negative tag. Yep. And then she's dropping any of the um, times that the country of origin was not registered within the data set. Which I think only happened a couple times. So we're not dropping yeah, much not data here. Yeah. Yeah. So let's run that. All right. So yeah, it's uh, all right. Cool. So now we have this coffee data data there set. All right. Five rows per country, one representing each category. Mm -hmm. And then we have the uh, the average across the population, which is in that endpoints column, and then whether the value is registered as positive or negative. Yeah, that'd be whether it's greater than or, or the values is greater than or less than the endpoint. Correct. Yeah. Yep. All right. 
So, uh, so now she's going to get into her actual generation of the plot. So first thing here is she defining her coffee bean image. So it looks like she uh, went onto the internets here, uh, like most of us do, and found an image of a coffee bean uh, from UNLV. Uh, UNLV. <laughs> German, German coffee. Yeah, yeah. Alright, uh, so then she takes a coffee data data set, which is that long data set where it has columns for uh, country of origin, values, um, and what they're, what they're actually measuring here, and types that into her ggplot. She's defining her aesthetics across the plot where the x-axis is the country of origin and y-axis is the value. So this would be uh, looking up at this point. Um, then she adds, uh, so countries on the bottom here and then the score moving vertically. Uh, then she adds the genome points there, so she's now drawing all the points for the, the scores here. Then she uses this chord flip, which I don't think we've actually discussed much. But what that does is it just does what the, the name does it says it does. So it takes it from this format and flips it, right? So what was your x-axis is now your y-axis, um, and in, vice versa. In newer versions of ggplot, maybe she has the newer version, and but in newer versions of ggplot, you can just flip your x and y in, in your AES. So you would have effectively say x equals values, y equals countries of origin. and um, exactly like that and you wouldn't need the step of chord flip mm -hmm. automatically knows what to do yeah. but that's all good uh, next she adds this genome H line so keep in mind that we're going to be developing this thinking horizontally like the values are going vertically um, and then once it actually gets plotted we're going to flip everything because of this chord flip so genome H line draws a horizontal line uh, the y-intercept uh, aesthetic is telling GMH line to draw the line at the value endpoint. So that's the mean value that she calculated earlier. Um, she's setting the line weight, so how thick the line weight is, to be 1.5, and the color will be gray. Um, she then is starting, these, these two steps here is where she actually creates her, um, her lollipop. So GM segment takes four different uh, aesthetics. It takes the uh, country... So the X and X end, which is defining the two X points for the line, the Y and Y end is describing the two Y points. And so the X axis, or the X for the segment is the country of origin, so that maintains the same, she's drawing a straight line. Um, and the uh, Y, so the line that it's going to be drawing is drawing between endpoints, which is that mean value that it has, and values, which is the calculated mean for the country. And she's going to set the color of that segment uh, to the pause neg, which is whether it's above or below the mean that she calculated earlier. Um, and then she draws her um, draws on the little lollipop point with the geom image, which is from the gg uh, gg image uh, plot there. So she's she's telling it, okay, now using the aesthetics that we defined here, because we're not overriding those, uh, add the image from the URL coffee. Here and set it to a size of 0 0.05 because otherwise it's going to be really really big across the across the uh, plot there. So it's going to shrink it down to, to 0.05 of what it normally would have been. Um, she sets her Y and X labels to be score and country. Um, she so she defined. She says she wants to be coloring right in just geom segment with pause neg, but she never actually defined what the colors are. So base GG plot will pick you know, these two colors that it has by default, but that's not always the colors you want to be using. So she uses a scale color brewer, which is from the color brewer, our color brewer package. Um, actually, it might be available in BASAR, or in, in ggplot. But uh, what it's doing is she's defining the palette, so it's she's telling it, this is the color scheming that I want you to be using, which is the BRBG palette, which I don't know exactly what that is, but I'm assuming it's uh, nice coloring. <laughs> um, and then she does this facet wrap. So that's, uh, that is what's telling the plot to uh, separate out. So she's saying facet wrap by category. And so what this does is it's going to now create panels for each of the different categories that exist. Because right now, if you were to have plot everything above this, it would have mishmashed everything on top of it. And, on top of it. and that wouldn't have been very appealing to look at. You wouldn't be able to suss anything out. Uh, because we're, we're, we're interested in how it looks across the different categories. And so this facet wrap here will now separate separate all that out for us. Um, the theme, so 
I guess if you wanted to set the order of the facets, you can turn category into a, a, a factor and define the order of your factor. Um, but in this case, it, it doesn't doesn't appear she cared all that much. Uh, she's setting the theme to be the FTRC, but, uh, which is from the Harbor Master uh, or Harbor Themes package. She's saying, okay, this legend that I have, I don't want it. Uh, so uh, legend position equals done is get rid of get rid of the uh, the plot there, and then she's finally piping this or plussing this into uh, GG Save, which uh, is a high quality saver from GG Plot. So I'll delete that because I don't want to save this plot. Let's run the coffee's not found. Oh, gotta run that. See, I get ahead of myself all the time. But all right, so let's uh, see this plot here. Apparently, my computer is not rendering rendering this nearly as nicely as, as she she made it be. But y axis is good. Oh, I bet you. I bet you she. Uh, um, by running it, she's able to tell it to make it really tall, and so when we kind of view it... Yeah, I think in, yeah. Uh, in her GG save, she had specified a height? Yeah, height and width yeah, uh, of this, so it's going to it's uh, gonna draw it a lot nicer. I'll just, I'll just run this right here, so that we, yeah. can, we can give it the justice it deserves. Yeah. Uh, there. Unable to start PNG device. Computer, what, what's going on here, bud? Unable to open coffee plot PNG. Oh well. Anyway, I don't think I'll be able to correct that very quickly. So uh, we're just gonna have to look at this. Or no, I'll just I'll just look at her her plot because yeah, it's so much prettier than apparently what my computer can do right now. Uh, but yeah, so this is how she created the the lollipop using uh, with beans at the very end there. So. I don't know. I, I like this a lot. I think this is a great yeah. way to visualize your data, to kind of show multiple categories, a uh, quick, quick way to get an understanding for it. Gets into the theme with the little coffee bean. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So uh, thank you, thank you, Anissa, for, for letting us uh, go through this and explain this. I, I uh, really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, really cool. Let's do this, because uh, this also led us to um, the next piece of the cast, uh, which Patrick is going to take us through. Yeah, well, I I like these ones. We've had a few drink ones now. We've had coffees, wines, cocktails, beers. And I think, you know, whenever we, we get into these, it's fun to think about um, some sort of classification, like classifying the overall rating of the thing, whatever that thing is. Um, so, and that's what we're gonna do. Uh, and we'll pull in the idea of lollipop plots here in a second. Um, and to kind of bring it full circle. We load some packages right there to start. Obviously, the two stock ones always tidy Tuesday are to load our data tidy first. Then we have three that we haven't used before yet, which are um, random forest. We'll use that for our algorithm. Uh, ROC, we're going to use that to, PROC rather, to produce our receiver operating characteristic curve for our model. And then the carrot package, which uh, you can kind of probably, I guess, think of this as like tidy models 1.0. So. That was Max Plume's first package that um, offered a number of machine learning opportunities for people working in R, which now I believe, I believe he works for R Studio doing Tidy Mod. Yeah. Um, we set our theme set because that's the one that we like, and we pull in our data using the uh, Tidy Tuesday R package from Ellis. Yep. Really easy there. We're going to use the coffee ratings data set, which um, because we've pulled in the data with the Tidy Tuesday R, we can get all the column info uh, by running coffee, and we get the actual page, the actual landing page for this week's uh, entry. And so there's all the info kind of about the variables, what they are, and, and a little description, so that'll be useful to us as we go through this. Mm -hmm. Just simple initial look at the data, things I always do, things that we done a million times here just to kind of get your bearings on, on what it is you're dealing with and, and how much of it you're dealing with. So it's a pretty big data set um, relative to some of the previous Tidy Tuesday ones, so a lot of information to work with. Um, we're going to get some variables for the model. So there's 10 variables that people rate the cups on, raters, not just people, but raters, rate the cups on. And um, 
And then the total cut point uh, is the aggregation of those 10 variables. Uh -huh. And then, so I pull all that information. And I also took species and country of origin. Um, so we're going to use that information in our model. So I select out those variables. And here we see a little bit of the data. So total cut points I'm going to use as our dependent variable. That's the target. That's what we're trying to um, forecast. And then everything else I'm going to use as a um, independent variable or a predictor within the model. So we'll do a little pre-processing here before we get into that. The first is I'm going to use this uh, summarize and across, as we talked about earlier, to um, just check for NA. So I across everything, across all variables, um, sum up anything that is NA. And we see right away processing method is probably a variable that is not going to give us a lot of information. We have a lot of NAs missing from that. Uh, it's probably not something that's regularly recorded. So uh, first first step is we're going to remove that and we're also going to remove that single row where the country of origin was a uh, zero just because it's it's um, not going to be useful to us. Yeah, it will get cut out by the model anyway, right? Like if it's NA, I mean, I guess depending yeah, on random, the... Yeah, well, you're going to build a random forest and random forest models can handle NAs within the data that you, you don't have to do. Some models are a little bit more finicky about that stuff, but uh, it, would, it wouldn't be a problem. Left it. But I, I figured to just try and get us to a complete data set. A clean data set there, yeah. Clean it up, yeah. Um, so a little um, exploratory data analysis. The first one is the total cut points, which again is our dependent variable. I just wanted to see what kind of distribution we looked at here. And really quickly I noticed, uh, oh, that's weird. Why does it go all the way to zero when most of the distribution is there? So I run the quantile and I noticed there is indeed a value that is zero, which makes no sense. Hence my question, some zeros, question mark. Uh, so um, I, I make sure and I check how many variables actually had a, a zero cup point, total cup point, and that's one row. So I just said, okay, let's get rid of that because it's not going to be useful. So I'm going to filter out total cup points do not equal zero. Get and then the next step is I'm going to create some bins. Um, so we could have done this as a sort of a regression equation and, and looked at the actual numeric value of cup points and tried to forecast that. Um, but I decided let's turn this into a classification problem. So I use the cut number function, which comes from tidyverse. And I pass the variable that I'm interested in, um, interested in cutting. And I pass it the n, which is the number of cuts I want to make. And so there's a number of different ones. I, I, uh, think, you know, playing with all of these, I've played with and, and used them in different capacities. But um, cut number is going to give me four quantiles. So it's going to split my data into four. I could specify whatever I wanted, and we will we'll talk about maybe reasons why you do other things. So go ahead and hit that. And then I drop total cup points. And so now I have this cup points bin, which we can plot out and see how many observations we have in each bin. So there at the bottom, we see our bins. Uh, you can see really quickly the middle two bins are very small and very close, so that might have lent us to only sticking with three bins, but we'll leave it at four for now. Um, the one thing to keep in mind with binning is that uh, when you do this, you're making an implicit assumption that everything within that bin is equal. So for example, in the far left bin, going from 59 to 81, we're saying anytime someone registered, a, let's say, a 60 or an 80, it's the exact same thing. So you have to know a bit about your data and the domain to know whether or not that's a safe assumption to make mm -hmm. or whether or not you need to do something else. Yeah, I think in this situation, that's relatively reasonable. Um, the I believe when I read up a little bit more about the copy rating system, it was anything above 80 was considered like a special, like really good coffee. And so like, even though this isn't exactly at 80, like this is kind of a happy accident, we're probably pr probably pretty okay. Like, right. Leaving that there. Now, if, if, and, it, and if we knew that beforehand, we might've just done a split at 80 and, and, and set a, and set a, made this a binary classifier. The only issue with that is we'd have 349 in, in the below 80 group and an over 900 so we'd have a, a pretty unbalanced data set. Um, and there's probably a reason why most of the cups, majority of the cups are over that 80 cut point because people have to pay to have their cup evaluated, their coffee evaluated. So it's not like 
Folgers or Maxwell Hollis or Sanka are paying to have their coffee uh, yeah. evaluated by these. This, yeah, this is like for for recommend or like recognition of, of a good cup of coffee, right. and, and so I yeah, it's probably unlikely that. Yeah, those big brands, they don't care. Or they probably care about quality. Like, they, they want to be good. They want people to recognize them. But it's probably more likely that a smaller company that wants to be recognized for their good coffee yeah. would be submitting to this. Yeah. Because like, they're so trying to. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly right. That's a little bit about the bins. <laughs> um, here's, here's a uh, look at the distributions of our... Um, of our different uh, uh, dependent variables, the different model variables that we're gonna use. So you can really kind of like look in and see things like sweetness, uniformity, clean cup. Um, they're probably not going to offer us a ton of information. We're gonna find out here in a second, but um, they don't have much variability. And that, that's something to remember is, is variability makes models go. Uh, if, if a predictor or if a, uh, a independent variable or a predictor variable, has no variability. It means it's not moving. It's not sensitive to anything. So it's not going to tell us about the outcome very much. Um, so that's what we, we can kind of just, uh, the idea here is just look at the distribution of our various variables. Um, so before we build our random forest, we're going to split the data into a train and test set. Um, I start out by creating factors for species and country of origin because the random forest uh, function isn't going to accept them as characters. It's going to kick out a big fat error. So I, I put them in as uh, factors within our data set. And then I set the seed, and that allows us to be replicable. And I get the number of rows of data, and I'm just going to sample randomly uh, without replacement. So replace equals false. I want to sample n times 0.7. So I want to sample 70% of the data. Uh, to put into my train set. So this gives me a value, this gives me a vector of row numbers. And then I just pass those row numbers into our model data set using kind of base R, um, base R coding right there, good old base R. So if I want the train set, I want all the row numbers that were in train ID. And if I want the test set, I want all the row numbers that were not train ID, hence the minus sign. Mm -hmm. And retaining all columns. Yeah. Um, I think one thing, I think we talked about this as you're going through this originally, um, that the bean type of the species is also really unbalanced. Like I think there are like only 30 or 40 some odd uh, of Robusta and all everything else was Arabica. Um, and so that would be a thing that you'd want to consider when you're doing your splits because you could, I mean, 30 out of uh, over 1,000 I think that we have here and what is N? Yeah. It's it's pretty small. So there, I mean, I guess there's the potential that in your training set you don't grab any of the robusta. Right. So, and th and that's uh, probably a error on my part in our above our, our exploratory data analysis. I printed the distributions of the continuous variables, and I failed to print the counts of the categorical variables. So, um, ha had we done that. Uh, from the outset, we would have quickly realized that and maybe we could approach sampling in a different way or maybe we could talk about potentially just removing those variables altogether because they might be um, not offering as much information as we hope. But that's mm -hmm. a great point. Yeah, just wanted to bring that up. It's a good one, yeah. Uh, so we're going to build our random forest here. So I'm going to set the number of trees to a thousand. So random forest is an ensemble based method, um, so it combines uh, multiple different approaches. It combines bagging, subs, subs, uh, subspace sampling, bleh, and decision trees. And it grows multiple decision trees by randomly selecting um, predictors from our, from our, our, our 10 predictor or 12 predictor options. And the way that we get it to select a number of predictors, uh, the other parameter that you want to tune for here is what is called mtri, which is the number of features to randomly select um, at each split of the tree. Uh, so you can, in, in our previous one, uh, in our previous Tidy Tuesday, or Tidy X last week, we did k-means clustering and we plotted the within, uh, within sum of squares and we plotted a basically a for loop that tried a whole bunch of different variables to find the most optimal number of k. We could do the same thing here with mtri. We didn't do it this week, but we could 
essentially go back and write a similar for loop and try a number of different um, features to select from. If you don't know where to start, um, the general rule of thumb, I'm sure along the way, along the years, there's been a number of people that have contributed to the inner workings of how Random Forest works, but generally it's credited to Leo Bremen, who I believe was a, a professor at Cal, I think, Cal Berkeley. Um, and he says when you're doing a, a, a classifier random forest, to begin by doing square root of the, begin your mtri with the square root of the number of predictors. So in this case, we had 12. That's going to give us like 3.5. So I started with four. Uh, if you were as a regression random forest, he suggests about one third, taking one third times the number of predictors. So 12 times one third, or 12 divided by three is. So we start with four, we're going to grow 1,000 trees, we'll go ahead and run a random forest. Yeah, so it's going to be doing a bunch of like crazy stuff, you know, in the background. Fast. Yeah. yeah. Right. Trying four random predictors at each tree split, one, and then building 1,000 trees. Yep, and then it's going to uh, aggregate over the, uh, the results, and it's going to use sort of a, a majority vote. So is it done? Yep, yep. it's done. Okay, so we call the model and we get information about the model really quick. We get our out of bag error estimate. So uh, as I said, this is an ensemble method um, that uses uh, some uh, bootstrapping. Um, so basically, uh, uh, or bagging rather. So basically it takes a bootstrap sample of the data and everything that's held out on that tree over the thousand trees, each tree is gonna have a different kind of number of data, it's going to have a different predictor space based on our mtri number, it's going to make a prediction, and then it's going to kick out an error, and then it's going to cycle through that. So we did pretty well here on the train data set. Obviously, the train data set is the data set that the model sees, so it should be better than our test data set. Uh, below that, we get our confusion matrix. So uh, as we talked about, the middle two categories um, are so close, and uh, you can see that they also have the highest classification error rates relative to the two on the end. So again, might be reason to go back and maybe create three bins if we wanted to, or, or cut the data a different way. Um, if we want to know which variables are most important to us, we can get the variable importance uh, by just using the importance function, and that gives us our, our um, uh, variables right there. Um, you can also plot this. There's a there's a uh, kind of a base R sort of function there that gives us the um, variable importance and it nice and organizes it. Um, these are plotted relative to uh, mean decrease in the Gini index, which is uh, basically a way of looking at the um, how, how important each variable is. So a higher value, the better, the closer to zero, um, the more suggestive that all of the classes have a equal probability of being selected. So which variables contribute the most to identifying um, the splits in the classes or classification of the, of the, out, the target. Um, that's obviously not a very nice looking plot, so we'll pull it full circle here to um, Dr. Uh, Silberger's um, plot, uh, and we're going to use a lollipop plot. So I create a data frame of the importance var variables from our model. I arrange them from high to low, and I take the row names and I make them a, a variable within the uh, uh, model because they were row names originally. And then I create a ggplot here. So we're going to use the, uh, the on the x-axis, the actual continuous variable of the mean decrease in Gini uh, index. And then on the y-axis, we're going to use the variable name ordered by Gini index. So it's high to low. Uh -huh. I'm going to give it geome point. Uh, instead of building the geome segment to make the lollipop, I use this cool little function called geome error bar h. And so I just have to pass it basically where I want it to start, which is at zero, and where I want it to end, which is the max value for each of the variables mean decrease in Gini. And the height zero just takes away. So this, this variable will create an error bar at the end on the point. Um, so I just put it at zero so that that's gone. And then just some uh, general stylings. We give it a label, uh, title, caption, and then some theme stuff. So um, I'm going to make this a, a gray plot on the background. Um, I just want the specific sizes and faces bold of my axis and text and legend, or text and uh, title, rather. 
For real? And so that's a bit nicer of a little plot to look at. You, Pretty can, cool. you can really see how important cover points is. Which I think is the points that the grader can give uh, to the yeah. cup specifically. Like, yeah, yeah. They're, if they're like, if they feel like the points that they gave it, like based on aroma, balance, flavor, if they didn't feel like that truly captured it, they could give it additional points. You can also see that at the bottom, so species, as we talked about, it didn't have as much value um, relative to some of these other variables, as well as things like moisture and clean cup, which remember when we looked at our histograms of our data were variables that were highly, highly at number 10, right? So they didn't have uh, uh, a lot of variability. Um, copper points was like right in the middle. It had a, a kind of a normal distribution. So uh, there was some variability to play with there that kind of maybe helped a bit. Um, finally, we can get a bunch of uh, model metrics. Oh, confusion matrix. This is the same as what, what you saw in the uh, model output. I just showed you how to make it yourself there. Basically, get your cut point bins, the predicted classes, give them names, and feed it into the base R table function. Hey, hey. There, you go. there you go. So predicting on the test data, so we're going to get the predicted class. I set the response to, or the type to response. And you'll see later I'll set it to probability. So I'm plotting my, I'm predicting my model fit coffee on new data test. And there's the uh, uh, response. Again, I build the table and there's our confusion matrix for the predicted variable. So you can see there's some errors and let's find out how many errors we had. We can calculate the model accuracy. So the way I do this here is I do the sum of the diagonal, which is the correct um, anytime that the model got it right, divided by the sum of the entire table, which is all of the possible observations. And then I just multiply by 100 and paste it to a little percent sign there so it looks nice when we run it. And it says model accuracy is equal to 84.1%. So not bad. If we did 1 minus 84.1%, um, that would give us our, uh, our error rate, um, which is um, slightly higher than what we saw. I think it was like 13.4 or 14 point something in the, in the original model. 13.58, there it is. So a little bit higher, but this is common because this is data that the model has never seen before, so it's new. Right? Which is the whole point, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. which is the whole point. And then we can get some validation metrics. So uh, I, I did things here, so instead of uh, predicting the response, I did the same thing, but I predicted the actual um, probabilities. So this is going to spit out a matrix of probabilities for each observation, and all I'm going to do is bind those in to the test data. And that gives us. There you go, I can print. So, that first example there, you can see again, majority vote wins. The predicted class was 83.7 to 90.6. And you can see that the model predicted that at 99.7%. So, pretty high um, probability that that's how the cup was going to be graded. And uh, the model got that one right. Um, you can interrogate the errors. So, here I filtered out anytime the the actual cup point bin was not the same as the predicted class. So we could, you know, if we were really trying to build something and, and uh, do this right, we could interrogate this and figure out maybe where the model's going wrong and what it's messing out, messing up on. Mm -hmm. um, again, you can see most of these are in that middle class issue. Yeah, where it's just like, there's, there's two, the points are too close together where it'd be so difficult narrow, for it yeah, to, exactly. to actually figure out what's the difference. Or the pro sure. probability of the difference is not going to be that high. Yep, yep, yep. So we'll get our confusion matrix then. Um, so this comes from the carrot package. So this gives us a nice little output here. Gives us, again, there's our, our confusion matrix. There's the accuracy of our model as we found before, 84.1, along with some corresponding confidence intervals at the 95% level. Uh, the kappa coefficient is a value that just tells us about um, when we're looking at the table of data what's uh, uh, what's the possibility of these observations relative to just chance occurrence, chance guessing what class the, the cup point then would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get some statistics. So uh, if this was a binary classifier, we'd have sensitivity and specificity um, with only two classes. But because we have four classes, we have sensitivity and specificity across the uh, across each class. So we can see where the model is more sensitive and more uh, specific sensitivity being the model correctly identifying the class when the class, you know, it's like 
if we're like COVID example would be correctly identifying uh, if the test correctly identifies those that actually had the virus and the specificity would be correctly ruling out those that don't have the virus. And there's a trade off between the two, um, which we can look at and plot with our ROC, which is the receiver operating characteristic curve. So I go ahead and I use the multiclass.roc because we have multiple classes. This comes from the PROC package. I have to give it the uh, cup points and then the response I have to make numeric. So it's only going to be able to take a numeric response. So I predict the values as uh, a response, which basically is which class they are. And then I turn that into a numeric. Um, okay, we select out the information that we need for plotting the ROC right here from that uh, element that we just created and and there's our ROC and everything underneath is going to, underneath that curve is the area under the receiver operating curve the AUC so we can actually get that value right here at the bottom boom and so the AUC is 0.923 the AUC is just a summary of the overall performance of the classifier over a number of probabilities of cutoff between sentences sensitivity and specimens. So we could actually change the cutoffs. Um, there might be times when you're willing to give up some specificity to have more sensitivity or vice versa, depending on the situation, meaning that you're willing to make some more false positives um, or you're willing to make more false negatives. That's going to depend on the situation and um, the errors that you're, you're willing to make. Uh, and then obviously an area under the curve of 0.5 would be that horizontal gray line right there which basically means that the model is essentially flipping a coin. <laughs> yeah, it means it's not helpful. It's not giving you anything useful. It's not giving uh, you anything. And the AUC, I believe, is bounded by uh, 1 to 0.5, because if you're less than 0.5, you flip it. Because if you're less than 0.5, oh, you're you predicting mean, inversely. You're, you're, you're predicting incorrectly more often than you're predicting correctly, so you might as well yeah. uh, flip it. <laughs> You're really good at predicting incorrectly. So you then, then in theory, are really good at predicting correctly. You're just predicting the wrong value. Yeah, exactly. Not, so, not a good situation. Not great, but that that's if you get an AEC under the 0.5, that's what it could mean. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> You're predicting a lot wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. More often wrong than right. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, but I think... Ooh. So that's a little bit on random forests and... With copy. Holy plots. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I think that's everything for today. All right. Yeah. So uh, once again, my name is Ellis Hughes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward, and you can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can get in touch with the both of us, either leaving comments on the YouTube channel screencast, which we like and respond to, or uh, via email tidy.explained at gmail.com. All right. Thank you so much and keep on exploring your world. Thanks a lot.